We are proud members of the Spy Podcast Network. Find out more at www.spypodcasts.com. Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. What happened to, to you, Chris, if you go to the convenience store and you put in your card and you know you have your money there and all of a sudden the card says no money and you everything you try, you try your Apple watch and you try your, you know, it, no, nothing works. What would like, what would, what would, what would you do? Lock your doors, close the blinds, change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. <laughs> Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. On today's podcast, I'm joined by former CIA analyst Yaya J. Thanusi. Yaya was my third ever guest on the podcast back in 2016, and he returns today to tell us about his exciting new podcast called The Jabari Lincoln Files. The Jabari Lincoln Files is a CIA-based espionage thriller that partly takes a look at the world of financial intelligence. Yaya and I talk about the real world inspiration for his podcast, and we also discuss his writing process and artistic influences. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did recording it. All the links are in the show notes below. Just before we begin, we now have a YouTube channel. I've been threatening it for a while and now we have it. So please follow the link below in the show notes and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And there are video versions of the podcast. So if you like to see a squiggly line with your interviews, you can now see a squiggly line on YouTube. If you wish to support the podcast, there are a few options for you. You can become a Patreon subscriber and directly support the show for three pounds a month. We also have a merchandise store at Redbubble. We have cups, coasters, water bottles, and tote bags all available on the Redbubble store. Also, if you enjoy this episode, please share it on social media among friends, family, colleagues, cohorts. And lastly, please leave a review on your podcast app. All reviews help the show get discovered by other people. Apple Podcasts in particular love reviews, and they really help this show get featured on the app. So please do leave a review. All the links are available in the show notes below. Thank you so much for your support. And without further ado, let's get going. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Yaya, welcome back to the podcast. It's been, gosh, I think last time we spoke on the podcast may have been about 2017, 18, something like that. It's been a while. Wow. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. A long time, but it's a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, you're a long timer. You're an an OG in the the podcasting world now. So it's great to be with you. (laughs) Yes. I was just reading about um, podcasting today. And I think um, this podcast is now considered uh, what they call kind of middle class podcast, the sense of that there's lots of newbies and lots of people who come and go, Mm. but I've somehow managed to keep going. So. Yeah, still here. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, and so because uh, I think I think I've been on this maybe uh, uh, twice at least, right? And but I think originally we're, this would have gone. I think we first uh, uh, I was on your show maybe as early as twenty fifteen, maybe 16. sixteen. Yeah, 2016. 2015. I think 16. you were number maybe three. Was it twenty sixteen? Yeah. You were my third guest. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bragging rights. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great to have you back on um and you be keeping generally yeah. fine and everything yeah very 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 busy on on my end a lot of things that have happened that i'm sure yeah. we'll go into yeah. uh that i'm dealing with now excellent excellent well you have a great new cia based podcast drama called the jabari lincoln files so i'd like to just have um take a look at some of the sort of real life inspiration behind it but before we even go into that there may be some new listeners on here who are not familiar with you and i recommend that they go back to episode number three but 
But uh, just for the benefit of new listeners, maybe just give us a little snapshot about yourself and your experiences. Yeah, I think what may be most relevant is I'm a former CIA analyst. I spent about seven years at the CIA. I was hired, and this goes back to the you know sort of 2000s uh, when I started. 2005 is when I started. Uh, so I was hired as an economic analyst, and I did my first couple of years. I focused on uh, economic, political economic issues in Africa. I dealt a lot with corruption, um, energy, oil issues, and the like. But uh, sort of early in my career, I switched to counterterrorism. So I volunteered to go over to the National Counterterrorism Center, which was an interagency institution. And I focused on uh, counterterrorist analysis, mostly dealing with Al Qaeda and uh, other similar jihadist uh, groups, Sunni uh, extremists or jihadist groups uh, plotting towards the U.S. I was on a team that focused on uh, plotting against the United States, uh, encountering that, and so uh, that's where I I think you know I spent most of my time. Now I left government uh, 2012, so I've been out of government for a while. Uh, and but I've kept my my hands or my foot in the national security arena really through the think tank world uh, in Washington D.C. So I've been uh, I've worked with or been affiliated with a few different think tanks where I started to do research on national security and economic issues, uh, and then within that. Uh, uh, the national security implications of financial technology innovation, such as cryptocurrencies, blockchain technology. So that's my background. And I'm currently, I'm the director of policy for anti-money laundering and cyber risk at the Crypto Council for Innovation. And that's a a, a global um, a global alliance of digital asset firms. Yeah, fantastic. That's really good. So, um, as we mentioned, your podcast is set around um, the CIA. And uh, so I was wondering if there's anything you could sort of tell us a little bit about your career at the CIA. Were there any particular um, exciting moments that may have fed into this new podcast of yours? Well, I think what the, the Jabari Lincoln Files is a uh, podcast. It's a spy thriller. It's an audio spy thriller. Uh, and it deals with many issues, but financial intelligence, uh, and also, you know, the idea of doing the sort of analysis where you have to link together clues, link together reporting from different sources to try to uncover what's at hand. And the way the podcast starts, though, the way the story starts, it sort of flips that on its head because you jump off in the middle of. Uh, episode one. So this is not a spoiler. This is in the <laughs> beginning of the podcast. Um, you jump in and our protagonist, Jabari Lincoln, is who happens to be a little background on him. So he's a, a financial intelligence expert. And he, uh, you know, he happens to be a Muslim American. He's from Detroit. Interesting background. And so he's in the middle of what he figures out is really an interrogation. He's being interrogated by uh, his, own, his own colleagues in the intelligence community, really the FBI. Uh, and so you sort of, you, you're with him. This this is someone who's you know done a great job. He's been, he's, he's one of the top analysts for financial intel. And here he is in this interrogation. Uh, and so you know, what I tried to bring, so it is a fictional story. Uh, people ask, you know, is is this my biography? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, not really. Uh, I say it's a fictional story with some very realistic elements where I'm pulling from things that either I may be aware of, may have experienced, or just things that you know are very, maybe plausible, but of course, put in a more dramatic, uh, more dramatic fashion. Uh, my time at the agency, I, I tell people that as a CIA analyst, I had, I mean, it was such a rewarding professional experience. And and why? Well, there was, you know, it's mission-oriented work. And that's one of the things, I mean, being outside of government, I mean, that's the probably the one thing that I miss the most, which is when you're in that sort of arena, you know, you know, every day you are doing something that is mission-focused, that is, you know, something like preventing terrorist attacks or trying to stop, you know, trying to find and stop folks who may be plotting against uh, countries, uh, yourself, you know, the UK, the US or, or wherever. And so it's a very rewarding experience to be involved in that. And it doesn't have to be, you know, you know, I don't have to, you know, it's it's not whether, you know, did you, you know, were you the one who did, led to one disruption or were you the one who, who found, uh, who found Bin Laden? I mean, I, I don't have that story, although, you know, maybe on the edges, you know, being, being around things like that, you know, I could maybe, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I appreciate, 
but it's just really just being a part of a team. And as an analyst, the thing I loved the most was every day I, I felt like I was trying to stay a step ahead of the adversary. Uh, we were tracking the intelligence. We were looking at different types of reporting and we had to think about, hmm, what would this bad actor do? What would, what would, what would he be doing? What is he doing right now? Is he's actually, he knows we're after him and he's going to try to figure out, figure out what we're doing. So that sort of really a cat and mouse game. I really enjoy yeah. Yeah, well, no, I can imagine that. And uh, as you're saying, like with um, sort of mission orientated, it's nice to have a job where there's like tangible goals and you sort of, uh, yeah, achieving certain things. So I can imagine the appeal there. And one thing you mentioned earlier with your story is obviously uh, your character, Jabari Lincoln, he is interrogated by the FBI and his laws. He's called into question. So I suppose, what was it like being a practicing Muslim working for the CIA? And did your loyalty ever get called into question? So, um, a, deli- a, a, a sensitive yes. question that will probably require a delicate answer. Um, you know, generally speaking, no. So, I, you know, I, I to set the record straight, there are lots of you know there are lots of Muslims, mm. you know, practicing Muslims, if you want to use that term. But you know, there are lots of people who are really attached to their faith um, of various faith faiths and and Muslim within within CIA, within the U.S. intelligence community. I mean, honestly, you know, the the, the counter, counterterrorism fight, right, couldn't happen if you didn't have, um, you know, Muslims, Muslim mm-hmm. Americans mm-hmm. involved in that. So it's not like uh, I would be an anomaly per se, right? I mean, I have colleagues who are former colleagues who are still there that have that background. Um, so I don't want to make that, uh, you know, make it sound like I'm so unique. Um, so the thing was, yeah, during my time there, I wouldn't say my for the most part, no. Uh, I mean, you, you never know what people are thinking yeah, about yeah. you, right? Uh, for the for the most part, no. In terms of my daily work and working with colleagues, people knew who I was. They knew I was, you know, an observant, uh, you know, f- you know, faithful Muslim, if I can, you know, use that term or that description. Uh, but um, you know, when you're working, like in any job, right? It's all about, hey, what value are you bringing? How, you know, can you complete the job? Can you help others? Can you help your coworkers? And um, you know, but the caveat would be, yeah, did I deal with some issues? Did I deal with uh, maybe scrutiny? Perhaps it was undue? Uh, you certainly, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll share that. And I think the podcast reflects some of those dynamics. Uh, in particular, the experience uh, of going through your reinvestigation. I mean, I was, you know, a lot of people don't know when you are, when you go into the intel community, of course, you go through an extensive background check. Uh, but that doesn't stop once you work. I mean, every roughly three to five years, you do have to go through a uh, uh, another background check or a reinvestigation, it's called. And I will say that, you know, I did have some experiences going through that process where, um, yeah, I felt a, a bit of scrutiny uh, and, uh, and, um, and, 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 and went through some things that uh, were a challenge, were a challenge for me. But again, I try not to paint it as, because, you know, this is a very complicated thorny issue you know security is not working for an intelligence community uh, intelligence agency it, you know it's not like working for ford or apple or you know this is the game of intelligence this is the world of intelligence high level security uh concerns um responsibilities authorities and so it is it, it is a very sort of um can be very tense and there can be a lot of scrutiny on you, on your actions. And again, for, so for me, it could have been one thing for others. It could have been, you know, there, you pick your thing. If there's anything, which once you're going through that process, if there's anything that, you know, people want to look at, uh, they're going to pull, pull on certain threads. So I did deal with that, but I don't, you know, again, at the end of the day, um, even though I had some, you know, I did have some challenges mm-hmm. there, uh, overall, it was a good experience. Yeah, good, good. So community and family play a role in your podcast. And what were the reactions of your sort of friends and relatives of your time working the CIA? Because I'm assuming they would have been partly involved in some of the, the vetting process and things like that. I mean, was yeah. anybody like in shock horror that you joined the CIA or anything like that? Uh, there was some surprise. I wouldn't say shock. Sh- I wouldn't say horror. <laughs> there was yeah. some surprise by some. Yeah. I mean, so you, you got to remember, you know, it, this wasn't out of the blue where it's just, I mean, maybe for some people it felt like was out of blue, but it really wasn't, right? I mean, I had gone to graduate school um, in for international affairs with a focus on finance, uh, and I was at the time looking to do something in international affairs. I was doing, you know, I had a different job, and I said, you know what, I, I want to get back into into the foreign policy space, and the CIA was was one option. You know, I was looking at multiple options at the time, and the agency, the CIA opportunity, you know, was sort of presented before me, and. 
And, you know, so I think there was some surprise by some, I mean, because you, you, you think about it, you know, the CIA has such a mystique, myth and misinformation. Some of it is, you know, uh, the, the Hollywood. Um, and there are lots of narratives about the CIA. And and mm-hmm. I, I had to go through my own sort of um, learning about, well, what is intelligence? What is, you know, what is, what is the intel community? What is, what does the CIA do? I had to do my own discovery. And when you, the thing is, even if someone had misgivings because, you know, let's just throw out stuff there. You know, they think, well, you know, the CIA is that bad agency that's going out and just killing people and, and uh, overthrowing governments. And they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not, uh, you know, they're, they're doing nefarious things. I mean, people have that image. So what do you do? Well, you learn about the, the history of the CIA. You learn about, yeah, what has gone on with U.S. foreign policy or with the intel community over the years. How has our government responded? How has the public responded to things which may have happened? Um, what are the restrictions and what are the, the guidelines? or guardrails for intelligence action. And you and then you also think about well how is intelligence globally? What are all countries doing? What is this thing called intelligence? Intelligence mm-hmm. collection is every government doing it? Uh, and if so, you know how do they? What guardrails do they have? And and you know once you really get more sophisticated about the, the question, it becomes less a you know a, a not black and white, but it becomes a, a just a less of a, a mythical issue and more. You know, I'll explain what what one person told me when they presented the option to me, and and I've, I've maybe I've shared this in episode three. I don't know, but um, when I met someone who actually worked for the State Department and was actually focused on State Department re- recruitment, but he was, you know, we had uh, we sort of had a, a good friendship and he was giving me career advice and he said, you know, oh, maybe you should consider treasury, maybe you should consider commerce, et cetera, et cetera. And then he said, oh, maybe you should consider CIA. And then he sort of paused for a minute. I'll never forget, you know, and this person is African-American, you know, and here I am African, African-American myself. And he says, yeah, you know, uh, I know a lot of brothers that work for the CIA. It's it's not your father's CIA anymore. <laughs> you know, those were his literal lines. You know, it's, it's not exactly what you might have thought it was. And, and and I saw when I went and actually visited, you know, actually the amount of, this is 2000, you know, this would have been 2004 or 2003 when I was doing my interviews. And, uh, you know, a lot of diversity that you, maybe you wouldn't expect uh, religiously, ethnically. So, you know, it, it's a bigger world than most people perceive. And I think people, mm. for the most part, were were fine with my decision. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking about when you're mentioning uh, the CIA's portrayal of movies. Traditionally, the CIA is always sort of the generally the bad guy in movies. It's only more recently there's been a few more positive representations of the CIA. Yeah, I mean, man, it, yeah, it is a bit of a mixed bag. You know, I, I think, I think, um, you know, we're at this part in in our culture where you know you talk about the distrust of. I, I don't know because mm. you talk so much. When you, people talk so much about the distrust in institutions. Mm. I I must admit. Because I don't watch a lot of, you know, a lot of the Hollywood depictions. Mm. I sometimes don't watch. I just, uh, you know, there are famous TV shows that I've just mm. never watched. Mm. I've just, yeah, just, I, I'm just not as interested in them because, you know, maybe I'll, I'll look and I'll think, oh, that would never mm. happen. Um, I'll, I'll give you one pet yeah. peeve, which is this trend of in movies where the different U.S. agencies are. <laughs> Are, are are killing each other. Oh, <laughs> yes. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I know it's, I know it's, it's just Hollywood, but but those things that, that that's really a pet peeve because mm. because I, I sometimes feel like you know people are going to start to believe yeah. that you know <laughs> that that be, that there's all these rogue rogue antics happening <laughs> uh, and that someone at the CIA is is killing people at you know, at DHS or at the Secret Service. I mean, it's it, it's 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 not how it works. So um, there are rivalries, but <laughs> not not to that yeah. extent. Well, it goes through fashions as well. I think it was the NSA in the nineties was the agency who killed people in movies, and then it moved on to the CIA again. Yeah, and then, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, but, 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 yeah. I mean, if any, if there are a few, few good. Uh, you know, it's funny. Um, people talk about the movie Zero Dark Thirty, mm-hmm. and 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 I thought the one thing about Zero Dark Thirty. Uh, again, not coming, commenting on the whole movie. I mean, that's a whole bigger topic. But the one thing I I liked about that movie was they got a few like. Uh, how would you describe it? Not the cultural things, but even s- few scenes and mm. settings. Like they got the the feeling, the sense of an environment yeah. very well. You know, that, I, I I liked how they captured that in a way that I hadn't seen yeah. in in a lot of other yeah. uh, spy movies. One thing with Zero Dark Thirty, everybody at the CIA had really bad hair. Is that a thing? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> no comment. I don't know. <laughs> can't confirm or deny. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I can't confirm or deny the, the, the hairstyle. Oh, 
for former CIA. <laughs> well, they aren't shooting each other, but there is a bit of interagency rivalry, um, famously between the CIA and the FBI. Um, and that plays a small role, um, or at least it plays a role in the first episode of your podcast. I'm not sure. I haven't listened to, for, I've only listened to the first two episodes, so I don't know where you, where you're going. But um, have things improved on that front with the rivalry? Or, and, and is the rivalry healthy or is it dysfunctional? I mean, you know, what are your thoughts on this sort of CIA, FBI, mm. and maybe even other agencies' rivalry too? Yeah, it is really bigger than than just those two. Um, although the pot, you know, in our podcast, we 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 focus initially on that. Uh, yeah, there's rivalry. I think there's healthy rivalry. I, I would say it's akin to a f- family with siblings, mm. right? Where the siblings and family members have different views and they're going to disagree about certain things and think that the other person doesn't see it the right way. Um, and that, you know, that that's okay. The question is, how do you reconcile that? How do you make sure you live together and and and, and live in harmony and, and do what you need to do as a family? And I would say that that's probably the same. Now, I have been out of the government for a while, so I can't, you know, I can't speak you know, intimately about mm-hmm. how things are. But I will say that, you know, I was at CIA at a time when the intelligence community was going through a a, a reconciling of a lot of these rivalries and the, sil- the sort of the siloed way that intelligence was pre 9-11 um, changed or, or was changing because in the U.S. we stood up, the United States stood up the National Counterterrorism Center, NCTC. And that was an interagency uh, institution, like I said. And so there you had CIA folks, FBI folks, NSA folks, you know, uh, DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, all these different agencies together, um, really working together in in this new body now uh, focusing on counterterrorism. And I noticed something because, you know, I spent I, you know, when I went there, I would spend time there and not at my home agency. I mean, I was still a CIA analyst, but I would only go back to headquarters, you know, every so often for for this for this or that. But I noticed when you're in your home agency, everyone else is the enemy. Everyone else you complain <laughs> about, you know, not the real enemy, yeah. but everyone else when you're coordinating on certain products mm. and in the, you know, exchanging uh, analysis, etc. You know, oh, every other agency seems to get it wrong, or at least I should say that you sort of pick on yeah. when you think they've made a mistake. You sort of, <laughs> yeah, oh, they always make <laughs> oh. DOD always does yeah. this. Oh, the FBI, they don't get it, blah, blah, blah. You know, that that's the mentality. And everyone is in there. Yeah. They're in that sort of a bubble. And then when you go over to an interagency environment, you realize that, you know, you know what? No, everyone's not like mm. that. They're good analysts and bad mm. analysts. Um, and, and you actually, the culture, I think, is, at least when I was there, is much more sort of open and fluid because it's not, every agency does have its own culture, right? If you're at the, the Defense Intelligence Agency, it's going to be very focused on DOD. And they're going to do things in a certain way. If you are at uh, NSA, very, very similar. FBI, very, very much focused on the agents and, and that sort of operational side. And the analysts, uh, at least back in the day, they were sort of on a, on a lower level compared to the agents. And all of those cultures are different. But at NCTC, there was this really, a, I thought it was a more open mix. You could really talk to your colleagues on the same level. Um, and so I, I actually enjoyed it. And I think that probably helps. I think now what, you know, Again, I don't have a lot of, you know, this small sample size, but I think there's a lot of movement so people can move to different agencies easily. You you hear about that all the time. So um, I think probably the rivalry is less toxic nowadays. Yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> that's good. One one last thing about your time at the CIA. So in, in your first episode, you mentioned something called a hall file, uh, which sounds quite ominous. Can you talk to us a little bit about what this hall file is? And uh, did you ever get to see your hall file or hear about what was on yours? <laughs> <laughs> The Hall File. Yeah, it's mentioned in episode one. And the, the Hall File, I think the way it's described, you know, it's 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 uh, more important than what's in your actual mm. performance file, your performance review and your employee, you know, your employee uh, uh, record. It is, uh, it, again, it's not a, it's not a, a, an official thing. But, you know, being a young analyst, I remember people talking about, oh, yeah, it's, it's going to be in the Hall File. You know, oh, that, they, you know that's her, that's his Hall File. That's her Hall File. Basically, you know, it's 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 what people say. It's what people say that maybe isn't 
isn't written around, written about, uh, about you, but uh, it is what people think. It may be rumors, right? It may be, you know, your your interaction, you know, those intangibles. And and the point in the episode is that that's what really sticks. That's what even, you know, even if you, you feel you've done the right thing, but in your hall mm-hmm. file, there's this mm-hmm. <laughs> asterisk maybe yeah. that, you know, oh, there, you know, there, there's this cloud over this person. So, yeah, so it, it's, it's what I try to do in the podcast is, you know, drop a lot of references that you know, people who've been in the environment would say, you know, oh, wow, you know, this is something that we've experienced. We haven't heard it in a fictional portrayal because these are the the little details, the little things that no one really makes a movie about. They don't, you know, they usually, these are the small things that are part of your everyday, yeah. everyday life yeah. and hopefully relatable, mm-hmm. right? Because I'm sure the Hall file concept is probably in corporate America and in any other agency as well. <laughs> well, it made me think of school because I remember like when you ever get detention, it's like, it's on your record, you know, this sort of mystery. <laughs> serious record that you have <laughs> yeah and you know what i was trying to do because i think you know and you'll get to see in 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 episode two it goes even more in, in depth into jabari and and the struggles that he has when he deals with this this uh the this big uh you know what has happened to him with his career and he goes through it it takes you through his own experience now what what happened how he you know did he try to fight this wrong you know he, he thought he was wronged and he tried to fight it but the the I think that part of the episode shows you that you know you're really at a disadvantage <laughs> if you, you try to you, when you try to fight uh, you know if you try to fight uh, the big bureaucracy mm-hmm. they're holding mm-hmm. all the cards mm-hmm. especially in the intel world yeah. right in terms of access to information it's not the simple thing that's why I say it's, it's not like you're working for Ford or GM yeah. when you're working for the intel community yeah. well um, let's move on to a slightly less uh, fun topic which is we'll have a look at um, a little bit about terrorism because the terrorist group Al Qaeda and I believe Boko Haram feature in your your podcast as well um so i suppose the kind of it'd be good to kind of get an idea of some of the key things that you learned during your time researching terrorist groups such as al-qaeda boko haram and isis was there any sort of key points that were similar to each other and also differentiated the groups and so on well i mean i think maybe what would be what what could i share that that's you know really relevant more today right because my i was doing this you know, more in the early 2000s and uh, to 2012 period. Uh, and again, this was really before ISIS was, was had sort of formed at, as a unique, you know, formed as ISIS for the most part. So, you know, the thing I would say that I learned, maybe what's relevant to f- folks who are not in that world, I think for me, it was just seeing the, you know, the the intricacy of the global, mm. you know, jihadist movement, mm. it being a thing with, mm a specific ideology and because I think it's tough when you're on the outside just watching media. I mean, unless like someone like yourself who's talking to terrorism experts, you know, like independent objective terrorism experts, you know, you would have, you and, and your audience would have probably a, a different sense of what what is happening, what are the threats and what, and the risks about these groups. But generally speaking, you know, I think most people just see what's, what's on the news or they, they hear what's in political discourse. I think when you're working it, you're so focused when you're working in counterterrorism, you know, if, if, at least for me, you know, I discovered the expanse of this group in a way that I wouldn't if I was just, you know, Joe Blow, <laughs> um, you know, Joe Blow uh, on the outside. Um, and the and I think what has happened, maybe here's an interesting tidbit. It's It's interesting because the global jihadist movement, you know, back then, you know, very focused, of course, in uh, the Middle East, in South Asia, yeah. for for the most part, right? Um, or at least that was uh, a, a, a heavy uh, focus of activity. And so looking today, now I'm not a CT, I'm not a counterterrorism mm-hmm. expert today. So there are others, obviously, who you would talk to, to talk about what's happening with the jihadist mm-hmm. movement now. But I think it's interesting that it seems looking from the outside that, that um, there's less that, that, the jihadist activity or the strength in those areas has been degraded, uh, you know, compared to in the early to com- compared to right after 9-11 and the, the, that first the, the first several years after 9-11. Whereas, though, you see the jihadist movement growing in areas where it wasn't as strong. And West Africa is a good case, even parts of East, well, East Africa, not parts, East Africa, and even Central Africa, um, you know, Eastern Africa, and parts of Southern Africa, where we're seeing the growth of the jihadist movement in countries that were very, you know, didn't, you know, it's it's, it's not that they didn't have a Muslim population, they've had Muslim populations for centuries, uh, but weren't a part of this movement. And to me, that, that there's a lesson there, which is that, you know, there's sort of a physical 
uh, fight and sort of operation there with these types of groups, which are very, I mean, still geared on uh, combating the West, combating the United States, combating other countries. Uh, you know, that that's still their focus. Now they may not be as strong, but they're still there. And so this is, I mean, I think what's happening in Africa, especially, and the podcast, you know, I mean, again, it's interesting because the story does start out with referencing the counterterrorism fight. And then I think as as we go along in this story, you'll see that it, there's more out there. It's it's not just it's not really just about counterterrorism. That kind of is the jumping off point. Mm, mm. Uh, it's really about all types of threats, and it it really turns into. I don't want to diverge from from your your from the conversation that you, that you that we're having, but it becomes really a financial mm. thriller, mm. Uh, a financial and a technology thriller that the plot goes into yeah yeah well we'll we will touch on that because we've got financial intelligence to have a chat about shortly so i mean yeah you've sort of touched upon this already i mean do you think that uh islamist inspired terrorism is a greater threat to the united states as it was perceived 22 well, 22 23 years ago now i think the threat landscape has changed i mean i think it's uh, still an issue i mean and, i mean that's the thing i think that i learned mm-hmm. about these groups is that you know, they aren't trying to stop. And that especially because of the sort of ideological underpinning, mm. you know, it, it, you can't, I mean, you have to see it as a movement that you have to, you know, a violent movement, people that are armed, that are trying to, you know, bomb, plot, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, but that, uh, that sort of operational um, focus does not always deal with the ideological focus, mm. which is a much more complex thing, right? Mm. That's more cultural. I mean, and then it touches on, you know, does it touch on religion? That's sort of a question there. Is this a religious thing that we're 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 dealing with? Yes, no, maybe. I mean, so so it's a lot more complicated and thornier to address. And then part of me would say that, you know, that's why it's not, there's not necessarily an end date. It's sort of like, okay, the jihadist movement is a thing. The global movement is, this is, is a thing. And, uh, you know, the, you know, the sort of Islamist, you know, way of, of, of approach, this Islamist approach to the world, um, can cause a lot of damage, a lot of havoc, you know, as these things grow and become operational. And so, you know, it's not so, but in, but compared to 22 years ago, I would say the threat, the threat landscape has has changed. I mean, these these groups are degraded, mm. and you would say, and it's funny because I don't think we even give the CT fight credit. I mean, it's funny because there was so much criticism, you know, about counterterrorism in those in those heydays, yeah, right? In yeah. the days when I was there, right? I mean, in the public discourse, I mean, it was, a, oh, you know, this counter, you know, all the thing, you know, because for legitimate reasons or not, or just, you know, people's opinions that that are, you know, that were valid, there was just so much critique, especially mm. during the Bush administration, mm. right? I mean, and there was the politics with it, so people didn't like Bush, and so they're not going to support this, X, Y, Z. So all of that was there. But if you pull back now, and really look again, not being in government, but looking from the outside. I think you can say that, yeah, yeah, we, we may have you know a few you know attacks here and there, you know, uh, uh, onesies and twosies types types of thing. There's still stuff going on, but really the security posture that the United States took and the CT measures, as controversial some of them may have been, you know, probably have accounted for a um, you know a, the saving of life and the fact that we don't have the same high level of threat as we had uh, in those earlier days. Plus, there are other threats in the world. Yes. Right? It's a different world. Like we have other global yeah. geopolitical well, and uh, security threats uh, that are that are in the world. We could, yeah, yeah. So much happens as we spoke at the pandemic and yeah, everything. Yeah. Uh, the pandemic is, mm. you know, and this is, you know, I, I, if I can launch the, the, the um, Chris, this yeah. is probably a topic for another show, okay. but I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it up and, and we can talk about this if you want. So I will say something, which is as someone who was dealing with not only counterterrorism, mm. but I did also deal with radicalization as an issue. Back in the days, you know, the whole idea of CVE, countering violent Mm, extremism, mm. sort of became a topic during this time, dealing with Islamist groups. Um, And the thing that I remember is that, you know, there are a lot of parallels, I would say, that I, there are a lot of parallels between the challenge of dealing with radicalization when it came to these Islamist, you know, jihadist groups Mm. And the radicalization that we're that's present now mm. in our societies mm. domestically, and 
like I say, this is a whole other conversation. This is a whole other show. I'm happy for you to go into I've- a bit more, though, because that, that's a, <laughs> you know, honestly, it's on my mind. I, I find it fascinating. Yeah. Well, so here's the yeah. thing. This is this is it's almost like not a bizarro world, but it's almost like I don't think people get what they're saying. So so let me. I mean, this is going to be a very blunt description. I know people are going to say, "Oh, yeah, this maybe it's the straw man argument," but but let me just let me see describe what I'm seeing. Yeah. So back in the two, back in the you know right after 9/11. So. Al Qaeda. Mm-hmm. Al Qaeda is a Muslim group, mm-hmm. and so there was a reaction to this very real threat. Mm-hmm. And there was countermeasures, counterterrorism, etc. There's you know, laws, mm-hmm. cases, mm-hmm. law enforcement, etc., etc., etc. Now, during this time, you know, you had a certain part of the Muslim community, you know, saying, "Okay, now well, hold a second, don't don't make it seem like all Muslims are bad mm-hmm. and all Muslims are terrorists, and we have to be very careful. Civil liberties, et cetera, et cetera. Free speech. You know, is this political, et cetera, et cetera? Is this uh, bias because of you know um, racial motivation mm-hmm. or, or mm-hmm. prejudice against Islam, et cetera? Like that was sort of the sort of the defense. And being on the inside, I really understood. I said, yeah, you know, we need to be able to talk about these risks as they are, but be very careful not to create. This sort of this huge thing where the threat is just the group Mm. and we blur the line between actual threats and risk and and, uh, breaking the law and violence and just the fact that people may share a certain cultural faith or affinity, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it was very clear that we have to be precise when we're dealing with this. Otherwise, you can have people that are repressed and oppressed because of, you know, the policies or because Mm. of public perception. Mm. So that was that was in the whole that was during the time of, you know, when Al Qaeda was at its heyday. So now this is my, I have a concern because I feel that in 2023, when we, you know, so much has happened in our society and there are all, there's now a a whole, a whole spectrum of threats, domestic and foreign that we're facing. And especially now when we think about domestic threats and domestic extremism and terrorism, it's funny because you have on the other side, now you have people who are, you know, you know, let's designate all these groups. Let's, you know, if someone, you know, seems to be supporting this person or that person, you know, they're a terrorist. And it's almost like I see things, a similar thing happening, a similar dynamic where there's lack of precision in what the risk is. And there's a lot of politicization. Mm. And to me, this is very you know, dangerous. This is very scary because I saw it from one side and it, it doesn't make it right on the other mm. side. So even the the way that people are very loose about, you know, domestic terrorism in some ways, right? There are real threats. There are things we have to we have security postures for. But we don't want a society where we're just segmenting <laughs> like a whole population because of you know political opinion, because maybe certain cultural ideas, and make them terrorists. Yes, yeah. It's a slippery slope, isn't it? It's sort of it's yeah. slippery slope. Yeah, yeah. And on top <laughs> of that, I mean, just to expand a little bit on that, there are provocateurs as well who it's a bit like when we were when we talked about the clash of civilizations, I kind of feel like there's a little bit of that we can learn from in some of this, because I feel like with the groups like Al Qaeda would sort of exaggerate the kind of racial differences and difficulties within the West and vice versa, you'd get far right groups who would make it out yeah. that Al Qaeda is representative of all Muslims and so on. And obviously those are two massive extremes. And um, and I feel like there's a lot of that going on with online debating today, that people are kind of taking things, you know, putting words in people's mouths and, you know, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And so, and, and, and maybe that's the point. Cause now guess what? Now we have social media yeah. more, much more because I, you know, again, I was doing this when, you know, Facebook was just barely becoming mm-hmm. a thing and Twitter was, you know, now, Oh my goodness. Social media has is so much guides the discourse. Mm-hmm. And a lot of this plays out on social media much more than mm-hmm. it did 10 mm-hmm. years ago, 15 years ago. So it's even, yeah, it is, it is, you know, it's a very, uh, you know, very scary uh, uh, situation. It is. It is. Well, I think yeah, we definitely should be good to chat more about this at some point. But I think uh, we'll move on to financial intelligence, uh, otherwise known as Finint, <laughs> <laughs> um, and that plays a role in your in your podcast. So I suppose can you tell us a little bit about what Finint is? Why it's an important aspect of intelligence gathering? Because you don't get many people when you're yeah. looking at espionage thinking about the financial investigations and things. Yeah, I mean, Finint is, as as people may think, right, financial intelligence. Mm. And I mean, I can just be very broad. I mean, if if you can compare the other ints, mm. 
right? Human, mm-hmm. you right? Human intelligence collection, SIGINT, you know, signals intelligence. And then, you know, there's all, you know, there's image, mm-hmm. there's image, you know, there are a whole bunch of ints, yep. <laughs> uh, o- open source, OSINT, right? But FININT is, is just specifically, uh, you know, using financial information, financial data, which is uh, re- collected and reported on to uh, to understand what's happening, right? And so, so Finance, what what happens in in the Jabari Lincoln files is, you know, I've made the main character. He's really a Finant. Uh, I mean, he's an all source analyst, but Finant is his in is his expertise. He is he's someone who ha- does have a finance background. He has a math mm-hmm. background mm-hmm. as well, and financial intelligence is what he's good at. So, what you see in the story is and. And I actually make this to ensure that this is very is cleared yeah. <laughs> and goes to before that when the CIA review board reviews my uh, content. Um, the interesting thing is, you know, I wasn't so much a finant. Well, I was I was not a finant uh, anal- focused analyst when I was there. Right? Remember, I did economic anal- analysis, which has some financial, but not you know not the the hardcore finance and econometrics or anything like that, because because I was dealing more with the political economy. But then I went to counterterrorism as a counterterrorism analyst. I wasn't dealing with finance. But when I left government, I got into the world of financial intelligence in the private sector, doing research on illicit finance and tracking stolen money, uh, financial asset recovery. So what I do in the story is I really refer to a lot of the finance and open source collection that can drive a financial investigation that you get again in open sources. Uh, and so, so we describe, you know, the, the pod, the story describes, you know, how business records, you know, that's a whole world. And that's a world I found out when I left government, right? The idea of business registries, which are used, I mean, people use companies to launder money, to create shell companies. And you find these patterns. There is a whole set of typologies of money laundering and of front companies, shell companies that are used by everyone from corrupt politicians to terrorists to you know, drug you know, drug lords, et cetera. Um, uh, to sanctions evaders. And so that's a whole realm. That's a very specialized realm of illicit activity. And so tracking it is a specialized realm, mm-hmm. right? The counter illicit financing. And that's when you get into, well, what are the sources of information? What we point to in the podcast is, you know, some various databases that you would have to check, um, uh, information that you can gather even from, from treasury that's out in the public. But as an investigator, what I learned doing open source research is it's really a mindset. So the finite, the intelligence analyst mindset is actually something that, that you can find and use outside of government. Because what that mindset is, you figure out where is data about or where where is data information related to your target or your subject? Where are they and where could that be accessed and collected, right? And that in a very just open source way. And we came to, or I came to that because when I started doing consulting and I was doing a financial asset recovery investigation, I was no longer in government and I had to figure out, we were looking at a, a, klepto, a kleptocracy network. We had to figure out, well, where could this dictator have hidden his stolen funds? And who would have been in his network? We had to map out the network. And then we had to, we didn't have direct access to bank records. We weren't in government anymore, but we had to piece together other information, public databases about companies where they would register and who owns those companies, learning how to go through different regist- business registry. These are like little things that most people don't, don't, mm, uh, mm, don't think about, mm. but, uh, but um, yeah, part of a financial investigation. Fantastic. Can you kind of give us a bit of a dummy's guide then to how terrorist groups go about raising and laundering money and what role crypto can play into this as well? The terrorist financing model has been around for, I mean, that's a long time and it's going to be varied. There are different typologies. I mean, raising, I mean, there's raising money of, you know, just using a front and, and trying to raise money, let's say as a charity. I mean, it, I mean, like, like what lots of illicit actors do, right? They have a front company, they say the money's for something yeah. else and they're yeah. using it for something else. And they have a set of, uh, you know, cutouts or, or middlemen, right. That are going to sort of be there, uh, be, be there, uh, be their fronts. Uh, you know, basically the, their approach is, you know, how can you, how can you act without your, your identity being seen? Right. So, um, so money laundering really, so there's the fundraising, which is one set of activities, but then there's money laundering, laundering of those funds. Because once you get that, like any illicit actor wants to be able to get the money that's raised and get it to the people that need it for their organization or for their operation. To do that, you have to launder it, right? You have to 
get it into a into a form where it's going to be sent through, through via a bank or mm-hmm. via mm-hmm. money exchanger, uh, money sender, Hawala, you know, or whatever. So getting into crypto, cryptocurrencies have become just another potential tool in the toolkit mm-hmm. of financial. Uh, of money laundering and of and potentially of terrorist financing. Now, what role does it have in terrorist financing? I would say generally in fundraising, it has had a small role. Mm. Now, a lot of the research I started doing back in 2016 was actually looking at that, looking at, uh, and this was through my think tank work, looking at um, a few terrorist groups that were actually going on Twitter, going on social media, Telegram channels, and soliciting crypto, soliciting Bitcoin. Now, you know, spoiler alert, for the most part, back in those days, they didn't raise a lot of money. These were smaller groups kind of raising a few hundred dollars here and there. Mm. Now, later, we did see other groups that were more organized, groups like uh, uh, the Al-Qasim Brigades, mm. which is the mm. military wing of Hamas, you know, be more sophisticated with their fundraising and raising more. But there's still some limits to that because the way cryptocurrencies work, those transactions can be, can be seen publicly. Uh, you know, crypto isn't like bank transfers where you have to go inside the bank and have access to see it. Crypto transfers, you can actually see the transfers from wallet to wallet on a public browser, on a public blockchain browser. Mm, mm. So it's a different type. So it's a riskier way. It's really not a smart way to raise money. Now, I would say that where it can come into play with terrorism, maybe in the laundering angle. So you know, if people are raising illicit regular money, fiat currency, and then they go and buy cryptocurrencies, you know, through a cutout, through somebody, and then they send the cryptocurrency to whoever they want to send it to. So not to necessarily to raise funds, mm. but simply mm. to transfer them. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. Well, is there anything else on that topic you'd like to mention before we sort of move on to your podcast itself? I think the only thing that that I would say is that, you know, we are seeing right now, um, we're seeing money change and evolve. So because people do ask the question, you know, this crypto stuff, you know, is it all bad? And is it, you know, is it, you know, how, how should we be thinking about it? And I think what I've tried to give is really a national security framing for this. So, you know, crypto is not all bad. Yes, it is exploited. I think, you know, I, I take a very, I think, balanced view, which is now we just have different forms of digital money. And it's not to say one is going to overcome the other. You know, they're not mutually exclusive, mm-hmm. right? The regular mm-hmm. banking system and, and and crypto. Now, in the early days, I think people, they sort of saw it that way. It's like, oh, you either have, you know, Bitcoin or you have the banking system. And they're, but guess what? As we're, you know, 10, 12 years later, we actually see that you know, nothing is static. Even the banking industry mm. right now is, mm. is, is implementing certain innovations and is, and central banks are now thinking about and exploring, creating their own digital currency. Um, Maybe in the future we can talk about China. Mm. Uh, one area of research I've been doing is on China's digital currency, which is fascinating and scary uh, because they're basically creating a, a state surveillance system of programmable money. Wow. If I can just <laughs> dr- drop that on you. Well, feel free to mention a bit more about that because, I mean, that, it is quite interesting. Yeah. I think it's a big threat to the – well, it's perceived as it might be a threat to the dollar in the future, I think. Ah, that's the question that comes up. And, right, so this is this is where we could, we could really go deeper. So I will say, you know, this – sort of tie level mm. is that short term china creating its digital currency is not a threat to the dollar short term short term meaning you know next few years or anything because it's not really the technology that makes the dollar strong and that makes a currency strong i mean if you have a, a a bad currency or bad economic system or bad fundamentals the fact that you can make it digital does not change any of those things right overnight so so but so you know and it's funny i talk to policymakers and folks on the hill and so so there's that sigh of relief because it's like oh okay all right but then <laughs> No, I'm not finished. <laughs> there is a, a, a looming threat, threat or risk. So yes, not in the short term. But guess what? It's not that China. This this first of all, China is creating a digital currency for a variety of reasons. Now, yeah, the the currency competition is an angle, but it, that's that's maybe secondary or tertiary. It's this strategy is more about innovating with technology that allows people to spend money uh, over, across borders over mm, time mm, in a new way. Mm, so they're invest so China's investing in this technology domestically for its own payment system to have a new way and yeah there's all the surveillance as a part of it. But they're also launching different pilots to get other countries to think about hey, why don't we use this new technology to conduct international trade. Now why might that be a concern? Because 
if China or any other country, if they create a new viable way to conduct transactions, large scale transactions, cross borders, then that makes the current system less central. And the current system is when we do international trade, we often are going to access the US dollar or the pound or the euro or the yen, the Japanese mm-hmm. yen. These are big international currencies that most gun, uh, banks and governments have to help conduct trade. And you need correspondent banking. We, I mean, we don't need to get too complicated, but there's this whole sort of interplay where the banking system is central, the US is central, the dollar is central, and our currency, Western currencies are very central. So if you have this alternative system, guess what? Now you can conduct value, you conduct trade without going through the banking system where the U.S. has a lot of influence. And that's where there is a risk to U.S. financial power. Not that the the yuan, the Chinese yuan is now so attractive, but if there is an alternative trade and financial global payment system that the U.S. doesn't have influence on, Mm. then sanctions become much less potent, potentially. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think uh, policymakers, this bit of a generalization, but policymakers and so on, are savvy enough and on top of this to kind of cope with what we've just talked about? They're growing and they're growing in their understanding of it. It is something that is on the minds. It's on the radar Mm. of folks, I would say, of the policymakers that that I deal with, with a caveat that you know, it's the first, it's usually about the, the first risk, but, you know, it's like, okay, they're, they're concerned this doesn't affect the dollar. So they're thinking about it. I think the second more nuanced risk of, well, hmm, you know, but long term, this actually could be a problem if these small pilots, if they sort of grow and then get traction. Now, that's something that I think they're less focused on, but I think there should be more attention to because, you know, as a CIA, CIA analyst back in the day, you know, we would think about if there is a threat, let's mm. say it's a mm. big threat, but it's far off mm. and not likely to happen right away. You still need to think about, well, what would be the indicators of that eventually happening, right? You sort of talk to think not just off and on, like, yeah, it's not a big risk. No, you sort of think, okay, well, what are the indicators? What are the things that we would see that would indicate that maybe the situation is changing and coming about a, 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 a terrible situation? And when I think about that with the relationship of the the U.S. currency and what's happening in China and some of these other projects, even Russia, Russia is creating its own digital ruble with the expressed intent to use it to circumvent sanctions, right? So all of this is happening, but it's not even just U.S. adversaries. Um, we can go close to home. The U.K. Mm. Uh, yes. is, you know, it, it, you know, has is looking into the idea of creating its own digital currency, and one of the former. Uh, head of the Bank of England uh, a few years ago, I remember he said in a very public speech, he said, yeah, the, U- the, the world needs to get away from using the U.S. dollar so mm-hmm. much, you know, because then we're, we're impacted so much by what happens in the U.S. So any country really wants to get away from this U.S. centrality. So, but it's not, it's not, that's not going to happen easily, right? Because the global system is so complex and, you know, it's, it's so vast. But when you see these little experiments, you know, China, you know, recently got together with the UAE, Hong Kong, uh, Thailand, and piloted this new system where they would conduct trade between banks, but not going through the regular infrastructure, going through this pilot platform uh, to conduct trade. That's a sign of what may come. Mm. And the US needs to take that seriously. Does it stop those efforts? Does it support them? Does it create its own? Like, what is the US to do? And I think that's where policymakers, I don't think they've asked those questions yet. Yeah. So something to keep an eye on then. And uh, definitely some future podcasts in that. So. <laughs> Um, well, look, let's let's move on to your excellent new podcast, The Jabari Lincoln Files. And um, so I suppose, can you give us a sort of an elevator pitch of it, a brief overview? What is this podcast about? The Jabari Lincoln Files is a, I would say, a fintech financial technology spy thriller. And, you know, it takes you through a world of national security, intrigue, espionage, mm-hmm. and financial intelligence, yeah. where the lead character, Jabari Lincoln, he is the CIA's top financial intelligence analyst. Mm. And he's at the top of his game until one day he's suspected of being disloyal to the United States. And that shakes his world, and it unlocks a series of events where he takes a consulting gig in Nigeria, a banking consulting gig, 
and then something happens. Mm. Some it seems like someone is trying to get him out of the game, if I if I could say that. And so the podcast takes you through this saga and actually asks questions about money and what would happen if there were maybe a new currency created and how could this impact mm. the United States mm. and even the world. Mm. Am I right in thinking this podcast is only just season one? You've got plans for continuing this story of this character? Yes. I mean, this is, yeah, that's the intention. That This season one, I think, is a full story mm. because what happens if you listen to even the, the maybe the teaser or the, you know, some of the, the pre-briefing that I've, I've put uh, before episode one, it actually sort of has this feel of found footage. Mm. Uh, if you really think about because the beginning it it describes that this is a new world that's upon us and what i hope is that when you go through the end so um, i actually could share it's going to be about eight episodes or so uh to take take us to the end and so and, and, and i should mention it drops every thursday a new episode every thursday but in the beginning you realize that something has changed there's been some big turmoil of catastrophe. Mm, mm. Well, by the end, we see what that catastrophe is, and we're left in a world which is very different than our present world, and hopefully the other seasons will explore that. Excellent, excellent. So what inspired you to create this podcast? You know, the early attempt... I must say, because I tell people it is not an autobiography (laughs) and Jabari Lincoln is not a pseudonym. I I I have to tell people (laughs) that. But I will admit, there's some real life inspiration. And the inspiration does come from, I will admit, and I've shared this publicly before, I'll admit, a few years ago, I was shopping a memoir. Yeah. You know, I was doing what, and I realized everyone <laughs> wants to write a memoir. Everyone thinks they have this great story. So I had a book proposal that I was going to write. You know, I thought I had a nice little interesting story that, that would attract uh, booksellers and publishers. But I actually had a little bit of trouble. I mean, with my first few attempts, you know, I talked to a few different literary agents and and I had some trouble getting some traction on my proposal. Uh, and most people said they liked the story, the idea, but it just wasn't a right fit mm. or, you know, I mean, w- w- one person, I, it was clear that, you know, you don't have enough Twitter followers. <laughs> you're not, you're not a recognizable <laughs> name. Oh no! I mean, that, that was, I mean, maybe they didn't say that. That wasn't the first thing, but mm. they said, you know, it's really easy to, to sort of sell you if you, if you're well known and yeah. yeah, you've got a good personal story, but yeah. yeah, I mean, you're not, you're not like a well-known name and we'd have to sell, you know, we'd have to promote you. And, you know, I was a little disappointed because I thought, I was like, oh man, this is a great story. But it's funny that rejection, it was rejection. My, my book proposal was, you know, rejected a few times. And I think after what, you know, some, at some point I said, you know what, you know what be, would be more interesting is writing something fictional mm. <laughs> and writing a spy thriller. And as you know, I had been doing podcasting before. Yes, so yes. I had a storytelling podcast, yes, the, uh, Rhythm the Rhythm of Rhythm Wisdom. Of Wisdom. Yeah. Yeah, Rhythm and Wisdom podcast, which was my attempt to do storytelling that was non-fictional, real stories. And I think we've talked about that mm. on your previous show, mm. real stories. And I had been doing that for a few years, but it wasn't very organized. It was, you know, sporadic and I did it when I had time. So I said, you know what? Why don't I write a story and then I could publish it in the podcast mm. and make it fictional and I could have much more fun with it. And what I could do is then I could I could put in things that I've things that are part of my current work and my current research, looking at cryptocurrency, cryptocurrencies and national security, mm, looking at mm. payments and the banking system. This whole world, I think what the podcast hopefully will do is it'll take something that is very esoteric for most people, which is how does the banking system work? How, how do payments work? Mm, That's stuff mm, that I've only mm. discovered over the past few years with my research work. And then I said, you know what would be great? Taking a lot of this stuff and making a spy thriller out of it. And that's, uh, and I just started writing. I started writing the story and integrating all these elements about banking, about crypto, and some of the counterterrorism stuff, the, the, you mm, know, the espionage mm, stuff, mm. and just putting it in a big mix to create hopefully a, a universe that I think listeners will fall into and just enjoy and care about the characters and the story mm. and all of that. Yeah, no, I've, I really enjoyed it. One thing that reminded me of the Rhythm of Wisdom was the importance of music. Um, uh, I don't know if there's anything you want to sort of say about it, because I, I find the music on the podcast really great. I, I think it's brilliant. It plays really good. Yeah, well. so w- the podcast, you know, many people may think if they haven't heard it, hopefully after listening mm. to this, they're going to go go to check out the Jabari Lincoln Files, yeah, wherever they get their mouse, podcast, yeah. Yeah. Um, and start listening to it. And you'll find, you know, this is not an audio book. Uh, I think people are wondering, well, what is this? Is this just a novel that you're reading? No, it's 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 not. It's really it's a dramatic reading where there is some sound design, at least in the 
background music to provide an immersive feel. So when the narrator is narrating the story, it's, you know, it's, it's coupled by this music, which sets the mood, which allows for dramatic pauses, mm. which also I hope increases the suspense. So I think it should be more of an, an enjoyable listen. So, you know, I did, so I wrote the story and then I created the sound design, mm. you know, mm. just myself. Cause that's what I did with rhythm of wisdom. I would write these tracks and often sometimes write the mute, write the story to the track. Mm. Um, there's that element involved in the Jabari Lincoln files. Fantastic. And the episodes are quite long, but it, what I found with it, if you just give it your attention, it sucks you in. And then before you know it, time has just flown by and it's really, really great. So I think you've done a really good job. Yeah. Well, I, I hope it, I hope people, I hope this is, it's maybe a different category. Mm. You know, it is hopefully bingeable or it's, it's a uh, long form. You know, I think people, cause people listen to podcasts differently. I mean, I'm a big podcast listener and, you know, I'm listening to podcasts while I'm, you know, washing the dishes mm-hmm. or doing something out, out, out on the lawn. And this may or may not fit for that. I mean, I think that this is the type of podcast where you are probably going to want to give it your attention. Mm. Uh, I mean, maybe you can multitask. I don't know, but I think to, re- I think hopefully it sinks you in so that if you're multitasking, you become a single task. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you start single tasking and you just focus on the story yeah. because there's a lot in there that that you may miss if you're not paying attention to to the story. Yeah. Aside from the real world influences, are there any other creators, writers, or even podcasts or uh, dramas that have sort of inspired your approach to your podcast? Well, I would I have to give credit, I think, to a very uh, an early influence, and that is an author, mm. an author who whose books I, I read 20 some years ago, I actually mm. read before I got into uh, Intel work, named Jeffrey Deaver. Yep, yep. And Jeffrey Deaver is a mystery writer. And uh, he may be widely known, at least one of his stories uh, became a movie in the 90s called The Bone Collector. Mm. And that was a movie with uh, Denzel Washington and Angelina Jolie. You know, this That's is- it, yep. He's paralyzed in bed, I think, isn't he? Is he like the veteran yes. detective helping Angelina Jolie? Yeah. Yes. And and Chris, I'm going to give, this is a bit of a, it's not a spoiler because I never reveal it in the show, but I'm going to give a little clue. So that, uh, that protagonist in the those Jeffrey Deaver novels- mm. By chance, do you remember what his name is? I actually don't. The, I the Denzel. No, I his don't. His name and the ser- the name of that series is the Lincoln Rhyme series. Uh, Lincoln, R- Lincoln Rhymes. Got it. Got Lincoln it. Rhymes. Yeah. Yep, yep. So Lincoln Rhymes is, his, uh, I guess he's a quadriplegic detective. And he solves these mysteries mm, with mm. his you know, partner, uh, Amelia, I think is, is her name. And I really enjoyed those, those, some of a few of his books because he's a mystery writer. And I think he's very good at explaining things that, you know, everyday people would not know. So he'll, he'll get you into the world of the adversary, whatever that topic, whatever the, the, that thriller is about, you know, maybe there's some sort of niche area and he, he teaches you about mm, it mm. as he's, as the plot develops. So you sort of feel like, wow, I'm, I'm learning. I mean, he had another book that was called the blue nowhere, which wasn't a part of the Lincoln rhyme series, but it was about hacking. And was about cyber, and this was in the early 2000s. And I remember reading that book, and he he takes you into the mind of a hacker, and there's all this cyber stuff which I had never dealt with. Mm. But the the you know he sort of brings you into that world, and I think that influenced me because as you see as the episodes go, you know there are going to be these little asides where the character is talking to you and he's explaining to you how the banking system works, how payments work, mm. and how all these different things work, so that you kind of learn as you're as you're drawn into the plot hopefully it still keeps you in uh in tune with the plot but jeffrey d i would say his mystery novels and i haven't read all of them but reading a few of them Mm. really i think impacted my storytelling Mm. um i would say excellent excellent it kind of the way you're describing it almost um reminds me a little bit of some michael mann movies where he immerses you in the world Mm. of like you know a thief about the Mm. safe cracking and stuff like that or black hat with the hackers and so on and yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, hopefully. Um, and and the mm. the funny thing is, I'm hoping that you know I could take something which is very, it's not nerdy, but you know, like bank payments is a very uh, bland. <laughs> <laughs> it's not something that anyone gets excited. It's very niche. It's very, very bland. But the what happens later, and this comes in the later episodes, um, you know, and even currency and how currency currency works. So I'm hoping that people, hopefully, I'm thinking the timing will, is good because again, without spoiling this this whole uh, plot development around money and around banking and how how safe and secure our banking system is 
and how the value of money mm. or the value of our money is all of that comes into play as we go through the story yeah yeah brilliant brilliant and there's something actually we take for granted money isn't it really in some respects about how it all works yeah. and so on so uh, yeah. yeah yeah and and if i can posit what would happen mm. what would happen to the world what would happen to to you chris if you go to the convenience store and you put in your card and you know you have your money mm. there mm. and all of a sudden the card says no money and you everything you try you try your apple watch and you try your you know it, no nothing yeah. works what yeah. would like what would what would what would you do sell my body to science i think but <laughs> <laughs> no, it'd be bad situ- it would be bad <laughs> <laughs> tough situation so yeah that that's a little preview yeah fantastic well like before we wrap up obviously it's your first dramatic podcast um so how did you go about writing it was this something you did on the side was this something you had a period of dedicated time for did you like go away to a log cabin somewhere or, you know? <laughs> I, I yeah i wish i could have been you know been stephen king or, yeah. or, or whoever else right go just go to a cabin that that, that i hope maybe for a season two I'll, yes. I'll, be, I'll be able to do that um well it it was i first of all i stopped my rhythm of wisdom podcast podcast, mm-hmm. right? I mm-hmm. sort of went on hiatus and I just went into the mode of writing. And I actually started before the pandemic. So I, I started writing the Jabari Lincoln files in 2019 before the pandemic. And I remember, I remember because I had a meeting with some, uh, some marketing strategy people in, I must, I don't know, maybe late, Jan- late 2019. And I remember saying, yeah, I think I'll be done, you know, by January with, with the story. <laughs> and it took two, it took two years uh, writing on the weekends, writing evenings. It became my, my project mm. and maybe the pandemic helped, right? Because I was writing through the pandemic, uh, you know, less to do. And so wrote it through the pandemic. And then, yeah, then last year I finished it or earlier this year, I finished it. Mm. And um, I actually, you know, cons- so here's a funny thing, and, and maybe I shouldn't give this away. I don't know if this will uh, prejudice listeners, but I will say when I started writing, so I write for a living. I've ri- I write as an analyst, as a researcher, think tank work. I'm always publishing. I'm writing nonfiction. I'm writing mm. analysis. Mm. I had never written a story or a novel before. So I will admit when I first started writing, it was just me writing without, um, without learning how to how to how to write a novel mm. right which is a, which is a craft obviously but i'm so glad i did because i started that way no i didn't finish that way because if i had waited and said oh you know what how do you write a novel let me take some classes let me oh, yeah, you know yeah. go on youtube and learn and plot development story development all stuff that is essential but if i had wait i, I never would have started <laughs> i would have been <laughs> viewing those youtube videos over oh this is this would be great but no i just started writing now, as before I finished, now I, I actually consulted with some. Um, I actually consulted with some Hollywood screen with a Hollywood screenwriter who I, I became uh, very close to. Uh, well, not mm. close to, but mm. started working with named mm. uh, Cameron Pasha, who has done some stuff in Hollywood. Uh, and actually, he read my story and he gave me some tips. And I went back, revised, so I rewrote much of the story, and I learned about character development, plot development, story arc. Uh, so, but before I finished, mm. I was able to, I think, write a more sound, uh, you know, qual- really qualified novel by yeah. by the end of it. Yeah. Well, I think it is a classic, uh, not mistake, but it's a classic thing. A lot of some writers, aspiring writers, go through where they kind of do get bogged down in the the weeds with the you know all the books and stuff and i think the problem about the books mm. they're very good at teaching you structure mm. but a lot of the books don't teach you how to take an idea and kind of go with it and um and i think a lot of people get a bit too obsessed with structure because there's only scripts i've read over the years where they're structurally brilliant but they're just very hollow uh because the writers mm. somehow i don't know got so obsessed with structure they've got to jettison things that really they should have kept and um so i always say to people now it's better to be um structurally unsound and just give me give me the deep dive with it and then we'll we'll fix yeah. it you know in the development process yeah and and even just realizing what's really important and so i learned this later because i will say in the beginning when i first started writing now this did not stay i don't want people to think oh you know it's not a good story in yeah. the beginning the first chapter when i first started writing it jabari lincoln i will say was one dimensional he was you know he's he's a crack analyst and you you know he's the smartest you know he's the smartest analyst etc but he's very one dimensional and his family was not really a big part of his story. I mean, he had a family and, and he loved them, et cetera. And I got some feedback initially. 
And even with the, his wife, uh, Jamila is the name of his wife in the story. And I got some feedback that, well, hey, well, what about Jamila? What about her? I said, huh, you know, I could expand the story. And, and what has the, f- the final product is, I would actually say, when you get to the, the whole story, much of it is a family story. And it's not just him and his wife, but it's his parents, it's his upbringing, it's his whole, you know, background and, and where he's where he's been in his life. Mm -hmm. You know, um, again, he is someone who grew up in Detroit and went to MIT. Uh, And so all of this comes together. And so one of the things that I did to, uh, to, to add to the story is I'll, I'll mention this because, you know, where do you find, I mean, you get the podcast and you can find the podcast wherever you get your podcasts, right? There's your Barton Lincoln files, but I added something, which is a blog. So I've added jabarilincoln.com that's jabari with two b's and lincoln like president lincoln uh dot com as his personal blog and so what it is is i am putting blog posts from the character about now 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 obviously he's a cia analyst so he's not going to talk about work but if you go to the blog in the blog i mean you could read it without doing the podcast but if you are listening to the podcast and then you go back to the blog, you'll see blog entries where he's talking about stuff with his family, a lot of background material that I'm trying to feed in because I got so once I finished the story, I realized, you know what, there's a whole universe here mm-hmm. and I can use the blog to fill in some of the gaps in the story about things he'll reference and then I'll have a whole blog post about that reference. And so I'm hoping that really what I want at the end of the day is I want people to enjoy the story and fall in love with the characters. Mm. And hopefully, you know, hopefully they will, they will do that. I've been getting good feedback those far, thus far. We're only two episodes in, uh, but I, I, that's part of what I want to create it. This went from, yeah, maybe being about me wanting to share, you know, my story to really just hopefully creating a, a, a really interesting universe that, with characters people enjoy yeah no, brilliant brilliant i was intrigued earlier you mentioned about the clearance process so obviously i've spoken to other writers um from a similar background to yourself with your cia past what was that like going through clearance and and what were the processes did you have to like submit scripts or the actual episodes are they like you know yeah the the process is pretty straightforward i mean before you publish you know before you publish any work fiction mm. or non-fiction mm. that um is based on or touches on issues or things that you, you know the intelligence community things that you dealt with or you know just the intelligence in in general you have to bring it before even if you've left been out for decades you have to submit it to be reviewed and it's not a review on the content of your story it is a review just of the classification level is there anything that is classified or that can reveal sources and methods yeah, yeah. from your past work or from, and th- that's what they check. And so I would submit that. Uh, I have, I have submitted that. And when, even when I was going through the process, you know, submitting it because you're supposed to submit it be- before it can be shared. So even during the, the drafting, I would submit it uh, for review. So they have seen, in fact, it's funny because they probably have seen many versions and, you know, there's always that part <laughs> yeah. of me, this is the side, the thing you don't get to see. You're always wondering, are they enjoying my story when they're reading? <laughs> you know, are they like, you know, are they on the other side saying, oh man, this is, yeah, yes. Oh man, can I be the one to review this? <laughs> you know, because I want to see what happens next. I have no idea if if they're enjoying the story because all you get back is a very uh, plain, stale, uh, approved. Yeah. <laughs> Your story has been approved and you know and the cia is not approving your mm. content they're not verifying it they're not yeah. saying they endorse it they're just saying yeah it's okay to be published yeah. uh it's yeah. not nothing classified is yeah here. there's a there is a cia publication internally that um that i've seen where they do review like both factual books and fiction and movies <laughs> um do you think hopefully your podcast might end up in there Oh, that would be great. I, I, I don't even, you know, I, I hope that, that, uh, that so I have a, I have an advocate in there who, mm-hmm. who's really enjoy has enjoyed the story and says, yeah. Hey, Oh, you know what, Chris, let me tell you this. Yeah. So obviously I've been submitting drafts over the past, who knows how long over the past couple of years, right. When I was going, going through this process. So I had, I meant to go public back in, I don't know, in late 2022. And I mm. didn't because it was ready. It was really ready at the end of last summer and I was trying to find the right time. So um, guess what I noticed? So I, uh, I noticed, you know, you know, CIA has a, uh, Twitter, Twitter page, mm. right? And they've had that account for the past few years. 
So a few months ago, I, I just happened to click on the CIA's page and they had a new podcast, a CIA produced podcast. Guess what it's called? What's it called? The CIA Files. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> so you know I was seeking that way to second. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Where did they come up with this? The CIA <laughs> Files. They've been reviewing my work for the past couple of years, and yeah. now they create their own podcast called The CIA Files. I see you, CIA. I see you. <laughs> I see you. Um, so yeah. yeah. So I don't know. Maybe. Uh, Maybe we could do some cross pollen. Maybe I can go on their podcast. You should. You should. That'd be good. Yeah. yeah. But no. When when I saw that, I mm. almost I almost fell out of my chair. I was like, oh man. See, this is what this is what the the review process can do. They can take they can take your stuff and <laughs> and do it on their own. Um, I will share one last mm. one little yeah, tidbit if please. I can share. Well, I don't want to give away stuff from the podcast, but I will say. What has been interesting about writing this, I have to say for the record, I started writing the story again in 2019. So much of it was written by, you know, 2020, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, It is so interesting that aspects of the story have come to be Mm. more versions of them. And I'll share one because I can share because it is, uh, it's episode two and you have, you've listened to, you said you listened to episode two. Yes. So here it's, well, this is going to blow you away. So, uh, and it wasn't last, what, what year was it? 2021? I forgot. Yeah, I think it was 2021. I got, and your listeners, they're going to have to listen to the to, to episode mm. two to, to get this. So, but I'll tell you this, Chris. So I got an email in 2021 from yeah. a contact yeah. asking me if I would present to the Central Bank of Nigeria. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> It's like they read your thing. It wasn't the CIA plant, was it, to test you? <laughs> so for, for the listeners who haven't gotten there, yeah. this, this is not a big spoiler, but Jabari Lincoln is part of the plot. So he gets summoned to the Central Bank of Nigeria to help them to help them with something. And he actually presents. Um, now, I did it. I did it remote. This was 2021. Mm. Um, and I participated in an event where they asked me to present. But you can imagine, can you imagine what I thought when yeah. I've written this story about this character who goes and presents before the Central Bank of Nigeria, and then I get this email asking me to present. So little <laughs> things like that have have uh, have happened. Yeah. And there are other things there that uh, I don't want to give away because uh, they're no. later on in the story. No, fair enough. Well, um, one last biggish question, and I'll, I will le- leave you be. Um do you have any advice for other writers and creators who are interested in espionage and terrorism? Well, yeah, that is a big question, right? Because I'm 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 a newbie uh, yeah. <laughs> myself, right? So so the you know, but I will share focusing on what I've learned, right? Is focusing on the very real elements that 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 are very tangible for, for people. I think when I first started writing, I thought you know I put these big these big plot developments and plot Mm, points and mm. scenes that I thought would be so interesting. And I think what really resonates a lot with people are more those, those subtle things. So I think maybe this is true about writing, right? Something that's tangible because it really hits an emotional chord. And I, and I'm seeing people, you know, react. So I've, I've played parts of my podcast and have heard people listen to thing, listen to it and react to something that's very emotional. Uh, so even though, even though it's an espionage story, I think you know showing what is going on in the minds of the per- mind of the of the character, mm. showing that uh, showing the emotional struggle that they may be dealing with, um, I think that is you know that is really key to get people interested in the story and the character. So you know besides besides that, um, I would say thinking about intrigue that can be more than just your regular, you know, action suspense. Now, obviously in there's a lot of suspense and there's there's action in it. But as you get into the late, later episodes, I hope to I think I tried to balance that with adding suspense which is more subtle, like taking situations again which are mundane things that everyone can relate to and then putting a twist on them like what if this mundane thing all of a sudden switched? And was no longer possible. Imagine the repercussions of it. And so maybe that's a little clue of some of what happens in the plot. Uh, to me, I, I hopefully that's more suspenseful than just you know your protagonist is hanging at the the bottom of the you know hanging it from a suspended <laughs> off of a ledge. Yeah. You know, which is good too. I mean, you know, there's some of that too. But the the this other the mundane suspense, hopefully, uh, I think people would like. 
Excellent, excellent. Sorry, just you were describing um, Hanging Off a Ledge. There's a show I just watched recently called Keep Breathing, and literally, mm-hmm. like, the end of episode four is the character falling off a cliff. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> <laughs> but anyway <laughs> i mean we we need that work sometimes yeah yeah we, we we need it we we need all of that so but so hopefully if i will feel successful if mm. people enjoy yeah. those scenes yeah which are in and they also enjoy the very subtle the tense you know the things that are not as uh, grandiose but still can be suspenseful mm. Mm, that's good good advice thank you well where can listeners find your podcast so the jabari lincoln files is on all of your podcast platforms apple Podcasts, spotify you know it's on audible uh, google podcasts uh, all, all of those streaming mm. places um so you can find it there directly now um i don't have a, a you know some people will do the website for the podcast i don't have that but i do have jabari lincoln.com and that's jabari J A. B B A R I Lincoln, like a uh, president Lincoln.com. And that's where now I've had to separate that. So there you're not going to see anything about the podcast mm. because it's in the universe of Jabari Lincoln. So Jabari Lincoln's blog is Jabari Lincoln's blog. So he doesn't talk about the podcast because it's in the universe. Yes. So when you go there, it's really a, a support. I think those blog posts will be interesting. Hopefully they're good. They're a good read, but you can find that at Jabari Lincoln.com. Excellent. And where can listeners find out more about you and your other work? So I am not on Twitter too much. <laughs> Most people say, but I don't blame I mean, you. I, I, I'm, 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 I haven't been on Twitter too, too much for, for a while. Um, at sign curve, uh, S I G N C U R V E is my Twitter handle. So you can find me there. Um, I actually do more social media on LinkedIn mm-hmm. because that's actually where I'm, I'm more sort of professionally. Yeah. Uh, I would post about a lot of my professional stuff. So, uh, so you can find me, you can find me there as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining me today. It's been great to have you back on. Always great talking to you, Chris. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies. 